you have your copy of God's Word, I would encourage you to turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 9. We are making our way and going to continue to make our way through the book of Daniel uh, here this morning. Uh, Before we dive into chapter 9, a couple of things that I'd just like to to point out uh, before we we read the passage together. Um, First of all, if you were not here last week, uh, there was a dramatic shift from Daniel chapter 6 to Daniel chapter 7, and that shift uh, was from a a narrative story of Daniel and his life and the life of his friends to a prophetic dream that Daniel had for his life and, the, and our future. And we looked at a lot of prophecies as to what those dreams would mean. And Daniel himself went from being the dream interpreter to being the dreamer and needing assistance and knowing what the dream that he had was. And so he got assistance from an angel named Gabriel who told him what these dreams were and how they were going to play out and specifically in his context. But I told you a line, I hope you remembered it and wrote it down, about prophecy, about this idea that prophetic literature, when we read it, we read it through the lens of an already but not yet perspective. Already but not yet. Meaning that there's, at least in that case, in majority of prophecy, there is an already aspect of it that has been fulfilled. And that's what we see with Alexander the Great and Antiochus and Nebuchadnezzar and all these other Darius and all these other people and nations that that came and went. But there's a not yet aspect of that. All those are prototypes and symbolisms and ideas that they give us an idea, but there's a fuller, bigger picture ahead for us still. And uh, regardless of if you agree with that sort of idea or not, we see that Daniel's reaction to all of these um, was, uh, he was not sure. He was uncertain of the future. He was, he was torn. He was afflicted. He was bothered. He was Um, In verse 28 of chapter 7, he even says, At the end of the account, as for me, Daniel, my thoughts terrified me greatly, and my face turned pale. And the same idea occurs at the end of chapter 8 as well. Daniel was concerned and and troubled by the visions and the prophecies that that he just experienced. Some time goes on, at at least according to the way that we read the Bible in chapter 9. And his response to that, or at least what we see in a literary context, because we have to keep in mind something. Daniel's a, a really complex book for a lot of different reasons, multiple languages, prophecy, and also it's not laid out for us entirely chronological. So we have to keep that in mind when we're reading, but at least in the way that Daniel arranged it, the response to these visions and prayers and his concern and his trouble was that in chapter 9, he goes to the Lord in prayer. He takes his concerns and his troubles, at least in the literary context, sense to God who sent him the dream and seeks his counsel as to what to do. Because we're going to read in just a second that what Daniel discovers while he, what we read in chapter 9, Daniel is also reading a different passage of scripture from the book of Jeremiah. And he's going to realize something about what Jeremiah wrote and how it's applicable to his situation here when he was uh, experiencing these things. So before we read chapter 9 of Daniel, I would like to read to you the literature and the prophetic word that Jeremiah wrote that Daniel was reading to set the backdrop here as to what was going on. In Jeremiah 25, this is what Jeremiah writes. This is what the, the word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, which was the first year of King Nebuchadnezzar, of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar is a little baby king at this point. The prophet Jeremiah spoke concerning all the people of Judah and all the residents of Jerusalem as follows. From the 13th year of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, until this very day, 23 years, the word of the Lord has come to me. And I have spoken to you time and time again, but you have not obeyed. The Lord sent all his servants, the prophets, to you time and time again, but you have not obeyed or even paid attention. He announced, turn each of you from your evil way of life and from your evil deeds. Live in the land the Lord gave to you and your ancestors long ago and forever. Do not follow other gods to serve them and bow and worship to them. And do not anger me by the work of your hands. Then I will do you no harm. But you have not obeyed me. This is the Lord's declaration. With the result that you have angered me by the work of your hands and brought disaster on yourselves. Therefore, this is what the Lord of armies says. Because you have not obeyed my words, I am going to send for all the families of the north. This is the Lord's declaration. And send for my servant, Nebuchadnezzar, 
king of Babylon, and I will bring them against this land, against its residents, and against all these surrounding nations, and I will completely destroy them and make them an example of horror and scorn and ruins forever. I will eliminate the sound of joy and gladness from them, the voice of the groom and the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp. This is the whole land. This whole land will become a desolate ruin, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. When the 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation. This is the Lord's declaration the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, and I will make it a ruin forever. I will bring on that land all my words I have spoken against it, all that is written in this book that Jeremiah prophesied against all the nations. For many nations and great kings will enslave them, and I will repay them according to their deeds and the work of their hands. What we see here and what Jeremiah is writing is identical to what actually occurred. Jeremiah said that Nebuchadnezzar, who was an almost a nobody at this point, was going to be somebody for sure, was going to overthrow not just God's nation, not just the nation of God's people, but he was going to overthrow all the other nations around it, which is exactly what we see is happening. Jeremiah was 100% right because he was inspired by God, and all these things are happening now, and Daniel is experiencing them. And he reads that passage, and he notices a number that sticks out to him, which is the number 70. And he has a realization about what is about to happen. And so he prays to God, and he makes these appeals to him. So if you can and are able, I would encourage you to stand as we read Daniel's prayer together. And Daniel chapter 9, starting in verse 4. And this is what Daniel prayed. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Ah, Lord, the great... An awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands. We have sinned, done wrong, acted wickedly, and rebelled, and turned away from your commands and ordinances. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, leaders, fathers, and all the people of the land. Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but this day public shame belongs to us, the men of Judah, the residents of Jerusalem, and all Israel. Those who are near and those who are far in all the countries where you have been, where you have banished them because of the disloyalty they have shown towards you. Lord, public shame belongs to us, our kings, our leaders, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. Compassion and forgiveness belong to the Lord our God, though we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the Lord our God by following his instructions and he set bef that he set before us through the servants, the prophets. All Israel has broken your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. The promise cursed, written in the law of Moses, the servant of God has been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. He has carried out his words that he spoke against us and against our rulers by bringing on us a disaster that is so great and nothing like has been done to Jerusalem has ever been done under all of heaven. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our iniquities and paying attention to your truth. So the Lord kept the disaster in mind and brought it on us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all he has done, but we have not obeyed him. Now, Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a strong hand and made your name renowned as it is this day, we have sinned. We have acted wickedly. Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, may your anger and wrath turn from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. For because of our sins and iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become an object of ridicule to all those around us. Therefore, our God, hear the prayer and the petitions of your servant. Make your face shine on your desolate sanctuary for the Lord's sake. Listen closely, my God, and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city that bears your name. For we are not presenting our petitions before you based on our righteous acts, but based on your abundant compassion. Lord, hear. Lord, forgive. Lord, listen and act. My God, for your own sake, do not delay. Because your city and your people bear your name. May God add a blessing to the reading and the teaching of his word this morning. Amen. You may be seated. Our connection with God and our relationship with God is in a cycle. And if you're thinking to yourself, Wes, you've told us this. Yes, you are correct. I have told you this. 
And if you're thinking to yourself, Wes, I wish you'd stop telling us this. I will make a deal with you right here, right now, okay? Here's the deal. The minute that we can break the cycle, I will stop talking about it, all right? So if you're wondering what that cycle is, I'm about to tell you what this cycle is because Daniel's about to allude to it, and we're going to mention it specifically here for our context and what's going on. The way that we interact with God and the way that God interacts with us is in a cyclical, cyclical motion. The idea is that God's people are in tune with God. God's people stray from God. God warns them and asks them to come back. God's people either listen or don't listen, but majority of the time, guess what they don't do? Listen, and then God has to bring about discipline and judgment on them, something severe, something catastrophic in order to get them back to where they were, in order to get them back to where God would have them to be. That's the cycle of what we see in the people with the Old Testament, and to be honest with you, that's the cycles that I see in churches here today. So, you don't want me to talk about the cycle anymore? Cool. All we have to do is break the cycle. I'm going to tell us how we can do that here today and through Daniel's prayer and what we just read. Here's the first point that I want to bring out about our relationship with God and God's relationship with us and our connection to him. Sin breaks our connection with God. Sin breaks our connection with God. We see this in verses 4 through 10. Daniel is launching into this prayer because he just got done reading Jeremiah 25 and what that entails, and he understands it, and he understands what's going on here. And so he prays to God, and he makes this confession to God of the sins that the people have committed and the sins that he's committed, and he he launches into this, this prayer, and he begins by saying who God is. He describes God in three different ways. He calls God great. He says that God is awe inspiring. And he says that God is faithful to the covenant. Great, awe-inspiring, and faithful. Now, I would just like to pause for just a second. This is for free. When we pray, when I pray, at least, I don't always pray if I, as if I am praying to a great God. I don't always pray as if I'm praying to an awe-inspiring God that can do incredible things. I don't always pray as if I'm praying to a God that is faithful day in and day out. I don't always pray to God probably in the way that I should, and I have a feeling I'm not the only one that is like this. What happened to our prayer lives when we, like, like, do we even understand when we pray who it is that we are communing with? We are communing and talking with the individual who originated and created and spoke the world into existence. This is the God that we have a privilege and we have an honor to talk to, that we have a privilege and an honor to cast our burdens on, that will even listen to us complain when nobody else will. This is the God that we serve. This is the God that we talk to. And we talk to this God as if he's some fictitious fairy tale. What's wrong with us that we treat God in that light, that we treat God in in, in that regard? No, this is the great, awe-inspiring, faithful God of the universe that when we pray to, we should recognize who he is and what he's done. Our prayer lives need a lot of work in that regard, if for no other reason. But that's for free. Nevertheless, Daniel begins his prayer the right way. He mentions the covenant that he is faithful to, that the Israelites and God came into, into agreement with and how that is being played out. And so he talks about all these great things and launches into this great prayer, super encouraging. God is awe-inspiring. God is great. God is faithful. Like that, that'll preach, as my preacher brothers say, that'll preach, right? That's something that's good. That's something encouraging. That's something we, we want to hear. But it doesn't stop there. He goes on and he makes this contrast between the God that is faithful, the God that is great, the God that is awe-inspiring to humanity. And when he describes humanity in verse 5, and he makes this contrast, he doesn't use words like great. He doesn't use words like awe-inspiring. He doesn't use words like faithful. No, what words does he use? Sinners, wrongdoers, wicked, rebels, backstabbers, unfaithful, disloyal. These are the words that are describing all of humanity still to this very day. And he begins this contrast between who humanity is and who God is and how different they are. God is faithful and righteous towards his people, and his people are disloyal backstabbers back to God. And Daniel says, because of what transpired, because of who they were, they deserve the day of public shame, as Daniel reflects on it and calls it here. They deserve everything that they had endured. And while Daniel is doing this, and while Daniel is studying Jeremiah, he figures out what's going on, and he puts the puzzle together, and he gets it. 
the reason why Daniel and Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, and all the others were in Babylon honestly had very little to do with Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Had to do with the kings and the leaders many, many years ago. You see, because Daniel was about 15 when he was taken back to Babylon. He was about 15, and it says that the sins that the people committed were far away. They were long ago. And who was paying the price for those sins? Not just the people that committed them, but Daniel and his friends were paying the price for those sins. He was 15 when he went into the land of Babylon. When he writes chapter 9, he's about the age of 80, early 80s. And he says, Jeremiah says, and Daniel realizes that they were supposed to be in exile for how many years? 70 years. I'm no math major, but I can do some simple math. Getting pretty close to 70 years at this point. And Daniel is anticipating the return of God's people to the land that was promised to them finally after all these years. For 70 years though, nearly 70 years, these people were disconnected from God. You had people like Daniel, but can you imagine, like just, just picture what Daniel could have done had he had the resources that the rest of Jerusalem had for so many years. The temple was there, the culture was there, the people were there, there were those that were leading and teaching in the scriptures, and, and the scriptures were there. Like Daniel had none of these things. Daniel had God, which is all he needed, but can you imagine what Daniel could have accomplished, what Daniel could have done, and how much more connected Daniel could have been if he had all these resources, and all those that were with Daniel. For 70 years, the people paid the price for the sins of the people that went before them. The connection of God was damaged because 70 years prior, the people of God refused to listen and obey God. You see, what I'm here to tell you is that your sin has consequences for you, and you know that. Your sin has consequences for the other people that are around you. How big of a deal is the sin in your life? How big of a connection does it, how, how big of a break can it cause? This is what Isaiah the prophet writes. Indeed. Indeed, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save. The problem is not that God is not strong enough. God is plenty strong enough to solve any problem that you have. God is plenty strong enough to deal with any situation that you incur. He is strong enough. Isaiah goes on. And his ear is not too deaf to hear. You can call out to God, and he hears every single word that you speak to him. The problem is, is not that God can't hear you. The problem is not that God can't do anything. What is the problem? Isaiah 59.2 says, But your iniquities, your shortcomings, your sins are separating you from your God. God's strong enough. God hears your prayer. It's not God's problem. The problem rests with you and with me. Your sins are separating you from your God, and your sins are hidden, have hidden his face from you so that he does not listen. You see, your sins personally break that connection between you and God. Your sins break that connection between you and God. And I wish, I really wish I could sit up here and tell you that it's just your relationship with God that your sins hinder. But that's not the case, and that's not true. We only see this, we see this from the life of Daniel and others, but, but think about it like this. I'd like to illustrate it and apply it in two different ways. One with a fictitious story, an example, and one with a real one that I encountered. Imagine to yourself, whoever that person is in your life that um, is a spiritual hero to you. Maybe they led you to the Lord. Maybe they baptized you. Maybe they discipled you. Uh, whoever it is, mom, dad, grandparent, sibling, friend, coworker, whoever that person is to you. Let's just assume for a second that that person comes up to you one day and says, listen, I've committed a grave sin, and I need to, I, I'm, I'm working through this, I'm confessing this to you. You mean to tell me that that person that you've looked up to for years and years and years, that you went to for spiritual guidance, that you went to for, for help, you're not going to, that, that your relationship with God that, and that your relationship with them is not going to be affected by that person's sin? And by the way, they didn't commit a sin against you. You mean to tell me you're not going to be affected by that person's sin? Yes, you are. Let me give you a real story. It's a heartbreaking story. About five years ago, four or five years ago, I got a call from a mom, and I may have shared this with you. A mom uh, from many years ago, her daughter was in my student ministry, and uh, she went off to college 
and the mom called me, and she was on her way back from a visit with her daughter who was at college. She called me, and she was just uh, uh, a wreck, like she was blubbering everything. And listen, I don't do well with two things. I actually don't do well with a lot, but there are two things that I really, really struggle with. One of them is hugs, and the other one is tears, okay? So I don't, I don't do well with either of those, right? Thankfully, this was on the phone, so I only had to deal with one of them, but, but she calls me, and, and she's telling me, you know, I'm like, are you okay? Like, what, what's going on? And she, she tells me the situation. She describes what her daughter's been doing while at school and some things that mom found while she was there. And she was just like, I'm really worried. I'm really worried about my daughter. And I'm not going to share with you what those things were, but mom had good reason to be worried um, about her daughter. And she, she was just crying. And finally, we, I got her to, to, to calm down just a little bit. And we were talking. And she said something to me that has just stuck with me from that moment on. It's affected my parenting. It's affected the way that I do ministry and everything else, really. She, she, she said to me, Wes, I just, I don't know what went wrong. I don't, I don't know what went wrong. My daughter was, was in the student ministry. She was active and involved. We, we worshiped together as a family on Sunday mornings. We, we, were, we were active in the church. We did all these, these different things. We raised her to know better, and yet she's making these choices and these decisions now that she's, she's not with us anymore. Now, I won't tell you what I said back to her, but I will tell you this. I can probably count on one hand the amount of times I saw that family sitting together at church. In the four or five years that I was there, they weren't active in the church. Her daughter never came to student gatherings, never participated in everything, but that mom thought, that mom thought that she was doing everything she could spiritually for her child. And now that she's in the world and has to, to live in the world and cannot be protected by her mother anymore, she's going down this, this path. The daughter had ignorance. She, she didn't know any better because mom didn't, didn't step up to the plate when in, she was in middle school and high school. And now, because of the sins that she committed years ago by not being a part and, and getting their child involved and, and being a part of the church as a whole, that they are paying that price now. And who's paying that price? Mom's paying that price. Daughter's paying that price. And the whole family's paying the price because of the mom's inability to see the damage that was going to cause 20 years out. Do you think that your sins just affect you? No. Your sins are deadly. Your sins hurt not just you. Your sins hurt those that are around you. But more than that, your sins hurt God. So what do we do then? What do we do with that situation? Okay, we, we, we recognize the disconnection that's there. We recognize the sin that's occurred. Whether it be yesterday or 20 years ago, what do we do? And here's the second thing that I want to share with you. Disconnection leads to judgment. Disconnection leads to judgment. You can insert the word discipline here if that makes you feel better. It doesn't really matter. Either one's fine. And we see this in verses 11 through 14. Daniel tells uh, and confesses all of Israel, all of Jerusalem, all of God's people have broken God's law. And they've turned their back on God and they pursued other things. And it's not that the people didn't know any better. They could not plead ignorance in this case. Daniel just straight up says they refuse to obey God. They had God's word. They had the prophets. And God even like spoke to them. I mean, how much more clear can you get that God wants you to do something or doesn't want you to do something? He told them time and time again, they just refused to listen to what God was saying. And God being God, God being faithful said, you know what? I told you that if you refuse to obey me, I have to act in response to your willful disobedience, which is discipline. Which is why Daniel refers to the events that he's in in Babylon as the promised curse. The promised curse is now being lived out in the life of Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, and all those that were there, not in those that committed the sin. The lack of connection to God 70 years ago is being inflicted upon the future generation after that. And unlike the people being unfaithful to God and doing what they said that they were going to do, God is entirely faithful, even if that brings him hurt, even if he doesn't like it and doesn't enjoy it, and he has to do what he did here with Babylon and the rest. And if you think to yourself, this makes God look like a horrible God. This makes God look like an unrighteous God. Daniel is very clear in verse 14. For the Lord our God is righteous in all he has done. The problem is not God's. Daniel says, but we have not obeyed him. 
The problem is not God and his unrighteousness or his unlovingness or his uncaringness. No, the problem is the people and their unwillingness to follow God. The blame for the judgment that Daniel is now living and his friends are now living is to be placed squarely on the shoulders of the people and none of it on God. They became so disconnected from God that God had to do something so catastrophic, so devastating that nothing like it under heaven, which is exactly what Jeremiah says and how Daniel describes it, that unlike nothing under heaven has ever been done before. Do you remember when Daniel referenced God and he called him awe-inspiring? We might think of that in a positive sense, but really what's happening here is this is the most devastating thing that is causing awe to the people, but not in a good way. Because they're realizing just how wicked they are in comparison to God. You think that being disconnected from God is just an Old Testament problem? Let me tell you what Jesus says. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. He cuts it off. But he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains to the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit. But you can do nothing without me. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them, throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. You see, it's not just an Old Testament concept, it's a New Testament command from God to produce, and not just to produce a little bit of fruit, but to produce much fruit. Fruit. And if you're nervous, like I can't do that, the answer to your question is you are 100% right. You can produce no fruit of your own, which is what Jesus says. You have to be connected to God, and God will produce the fruit through you. You want to produce much fruit, as Jesus says here, be connected to God, and God will produce the fruit in you. He does everything for you. All you have to do is listen and obey. All you have to do is hear and do. But if you don't, What does Jesus say you're going to do? Cut the branches off, throw them to the side of the road. When they dry out, we're going to put them on fire. It's a metaphor for what he does with the people and what he had to do with his own people in the case of Nebuchadnezzar and the life of Daniel. You see, in the life of God's people, as they pull further and further away from God, eventually God sends his judgments in order to get them closer and closer to him. And we're not the nation of Israel, please understand that, but the way that God operates today is almost identical to the way that God operates then. We, as the church, stray further and further away from God, and then God has to bring us back, sometimes through drastic measures of discipline, to get back connected with him. And it's not because God wants to do it. See, don't, don't picture God as this God who's just waiting, like rubbing his hands together, waiting to pounce on us the moment that we mess up. That's not the God that we serve. God doesn't enjoy this. God doesn't, God doesn't enjoy the things that he has to do, the discipline that he has to give us, but he, but he does it because he loves you too much not to. Meaning, if we had been connected to God from the very beginning, we would never have to walk the path of discipline. If the people of God in the Old Testament would have been connected to God and they would have listened to God, they would not have been sent into exile for 70 years. <clears throat> Let me go back to that, that story earlier. Parents, if... Uh, Get your child connected to God. And everybody else, if you think that I'm just talking to parents in regards to that, let us do the hard things today. Let us be connected to God today so that my generation and my children don't have to go into exile. I don't want my kids to have to go through the junk that I've had to go through. I love them too deeply for that. And I really think that you don't want that either. Let's be connected to God today so we can avoid this whole mess and we can show them what it's like to be connected. You see, because I know in my darkest times, the darker it got, the more disconnected I was from God till God lifted me up out of that time. 
the more disconnected I felt. And I think if I ask you the question in your darkest times, how connected were you to God? You probably would say something very similar. The further we get from God, the darker it gets and the more disconnected we get. So what do we do? What do we do when we're ready to be lifted up and we understand that? Daniel tells us in verses 15 through 19, in judgment, we appeal to God's righteousness. Daniel recalls a major event in the life of the people, the exodus from Egypt into the promised land. He gave credit wholly and fully to where it belonged, which was God. You see, God not only delivered them through plagues and all this other stuff that they had to do, but, but once they were on their way, he provided them food, he provided them water, he gave them everything. He freed them from slavery, he delivered them, he provided, like, he did all of these things. He was loyal to them, he helped them, he assisted them, he led, he led them, and he guided them. He did all these things. And what did, what, did, what did God get in return from the people? Wickedness and sin and disobedience and disloyalty. Daniel's point here is saying that while we're in judgment— We cannot appeal to our own good deeds in order to remove the discipline that's on our life. And if you're trying to do that, let me tell you why that doesn't work. You see, because we could sit down and we could write a list of all the good things that we've done. We could write a list of all the committees that we've served on. We could write a list of all the people we've shared the gospel with. We could write a list of of all the people that we've helped. We could write a list of all the the good things, every single one of them. We could write them down if we wanted to. That is an option, and we could submit this to God and say, God, here's why you should bless me, and here's why we're going to be connected, because of all the good things that I've done. You can do that. The problem with that, though, is that while that's going on and you're writing your list, there's another list that's three times as long with all the sinful, wicked things that you've done. If you're trying to outdo the bad in your life, you're going to fail, and you are doomed from the very start. You cannot outdo the bad things that you do. You cannot outwin sin. You can't can't be more righteous than you are sinful. So what are we to do? What Daniel did in verse 18, for we are not presenting our petitions before you based on our righteous act, but based upon your abundant compassion. Daniel's an intelligent guy. He's extremely smart, and the pattern that he sees here is, I think, a pattern that we need to adopt. If you're in the darkness and you want to be connected to God, I just submit to you today, you can't do anything to get out of the darkness except appeal to God's mercy. And we see, based upon history, that when Daniel did this, he granted his request, and the people were sent out of exile and returned to their promised land. And in the New Testament— you're trying to outdo the sin that you've done. Jesus has played the ultimate trump card here, and he says, while you were still sinners, Paul says in Romans 5, 8, Christ died for you. While you were committing unrighteous acts, the Savior of the world was dying on a cross to free you and to save you from those unrighteous acts. I'm going to ask Aya to come up, and as we close out, I, I want to I categorize into, into three different categories where I think majority of us are probably in today first category is uh is you are a christian a follower of god that is connected to god and if that's the case i would encourage you one of the ways that we break the cycle is by recognizing the cycle when it's about to start when we feel like we're straying away from god and we're a christian that's connected to god we'll know that and we revert and we go back and we repent and we seek god's face and we seek god's wisdom and guidance If we're a Christian that's connected to God, and if that's you here today, I would encourage you to be on the lookout and be ready, because it will happen. And don't go down the road of sin. Instead, pursue God and his righteousness. Maybe you're here today and you're a Christian that's disconnected from God. You're in the darkness and you're straying away from him and and not sure what what tomorrow is, is even going to bring. I would encourage you that today can be the day that you can be delivered from that. Not because I have any power or you have any power, because... We serve a God that is merciful, a God that loves us, and a God that doesn't want to see us that way. And when we appeal to that God, not based on ourselves, but on his mercy, he will grant it. And then the third is is maybe we're, we're not a Christian at all. And can I just gently suggest to you that if that's the case, then we are probably more disconnected from God than anybody else. But the good news is this, that you have an opportunity be connected to him for the very first time today and to pursue life and to be delivered into life abundance as we stand and sing together.